and welcome everyone to the PMO Virtual Summit. We have an exciting session with you today. We have Chris Croft, who is a management trainer at Chris Croft Training here. Chris, welcome to the PMO Virtual Summit. It's great to have you here. It's great to be here. Awesome. Well, let me go ahead and tell you a bit about Chris before we get into his uh, presentation on the top 10 project management mistakes. Chris Croft has an engineering degree from the University of Cambridge in the UK and an MBA. He's worked as a senior manager in manufacturing for 10 years and then as a, as a university lecturer for another five years before starting his own training company in 1995. And since then, Chris has trained over 80,000 people and his free email tips are sent to 20,000 people. Chris is also featured on lynda.com and LinkedIn Learning where he teaches on time management, project management, assert assertiveness, negotiation, and more. His lynda.com project management course has had over a million views and it's probably the most, <laughs> it's probably the most project management, uh, most viewed project management course in the world. Is that right, Chris? I think it, yeah, it's right up there. It might be number that two. is a massive accomplishment. Congratulations on that. Oh, well, everyone, there you have it. That's Chris Croft for you. Chris, with that, I'll hand it over to you. Take it away. Yes, thank you very much, Hussain. So we're going to whiz through the top 10 project management mistakes. And if you can avoid these 10 things, you will avoid probably 90% of what goes wrong in projects. So these 10 things have to be worth doing. I'm going to spend a bit more time on the first one than I do on the other nine. So, uh, so don't worry if you think he's never going to finish these because I'm going to I just need to go to a bit of detail about planning on the first one. So let's have a look then. The, um, the first of my 10 project management mistakes is having the plan in your head. You would be mad to try to hold your project management plan in your head. In fact, I would say it's impossible. I just think you can't, um, especially if you've got multiple projects as well. If you've got many projects, you're never going to hold them all in your head. It'll be really stressful and horrible. What happens if you uh, go under a bus? and it's all in your head but also you can't show your boss that everything's fine and you can't show your boss why you need six months to do the project and he or she wants it in three months you can't show the team how their part fits into the bigger picture and you can't show the customers that you know what you're doing that you have a plan and you can't show them why it takes six months when they want in three so for all these reasons you have to have something that you can show people um, and what would a plan look like? And I, I think there are two phases to the plan. There's the good old network diagram that I'm sure you guys watching this will all know. I actually like post-it notes. I know they're really low tech, but that's how I like to do it. And for big complicated projects, I have um, sub post-it notes. So modifying the building's eight weeks, I could have a sub plan of what I'm doing for those eight weeks. Uh, and then this is my high level plan. So you can see on this particular one, um, the longest path goes through finding the site, because that's four compared to two. Then it's buying the site, modifying the buildings, and installing the furniture. And that's my, uh, my longest plan, my longest path. Once you've got that, um, you can then make it into a Gantt chart. And I think the Gantt chart is absolutely key to everything. So you can see here what I've done is I've just taken my critical path, and I've got that coming down in steps. You can see it's four weeks, four weeks, 10 weeks, eight. So I've done that there. Um, and then once I've got the critical path, which is dead easy, uh, I can put in the floating tasks, which are a bit more tricky. They all hang off the critical path. You probably know this. This is just a, a quick bit of revision. But you can see that already you couldn't possibly keep all this in your head. I mean, it would be horrendous. How can you remember that on week 20 you need to be finding furniture suppliers or whatever? You just can't do it in your head. So you can see, by the way, that this task here comes after the country and before buying the site. So that's in there. That's the permit. And then this little double here, these two are happening at the same time as buying, uh, as modifying the buildings. So you can see they come after buying the site, which is after here, and they have to be done before we install the furniture, which is that one. And uh, similarly, we've got the uh, manager and the staff, so they are there sharing that bit of float. They can be any time after we've found the site. I've decided to get the manager as soon as possible. I'm going to get the staff as late as possible because they cost me money, whereas the manager can help me with all this other stuff. Finally, I've got advertising, comes after I've got the permit, so it's hanging off that floating task there. I can advertise whenever I like. I'm actually going to do it right at the end, I think, for, for four weeks as well. So creating my Gantt chart is really easy if I've got the post-it note diagram. 
And it's the Gantt chart that I really want. And that cannot be stored in your head. You have to have that to show to bosses, teams, customers, and to mean that you don't have the stress of keeping multiple projects in your head. Okay, so that is uh, mistake number one, very commonly made. And in fact, I've been asking around and I've been observing the places where I do training courses. Hussein mentioned I've probably trained 80,000 people because I've been doing project management almost every day for 20 years in different organizations. And my experience is that 20% of projects have no plan at all. They're just, people are just making it up in their head, running around on fire. Um, I could be controversial and say that this is what agile is, but I better not go there on this talk. There's another 25% that do have a plan, but it's in someone's head. Some clever person has worked out what they think the best way to do the project is. Their plan is probably wrong, and nobody else knows what the plan is. It's in their head, and that's really what I've just been talking about. But let's just look at the, uh, the amber and the yellow and the green. I think there's probably another quarter of projects where the plan is a list of tasks, maybe with dates on. Now, I'm going to come back to this later because this is one of my 10 mistakes as well. But if you have just a list of tasks, then you've guessed the dates. You can't see the dependencies. You can't see what's critical. You can't see what's big or small. You can't see the resources. It's... It's better than nothing, but it's really not good enough to have a list of tasks. So now we come to Gantt charts. And I think probably a third of projects, 30% at least, have a Gantt chart of some sort. And I think 10% have a Gantt chart without a critical path. Just a bunch of tasks put onto a timeline of what we're going to do where. So you can't see what's critical and you don't know how much float anything's got. They're all just drawn on there. If something runs late, you don't know whether it's going to matter. And you might wonder how anybody can even create a Gantt chart without a critical path. But Microsoft Project encourages this. Um, so it is very easy just to bung tasks on. If you, if you don't do the post-it notes first, if you don't do it properly, you end up with a plan that is better than nothing, but not really good enough. The next 10%, there's a Gantt chart, and it has got a critical path, but it wasn't based on the post-it, so it's probably not correct. So every now and then, I see a project plan, and there's, a, and there's a critical path. And I say, how did you get the critical path? And they just go, well, those are the most important tasks. But of course, critical just means time critical. It just means the slowest path. And those tasks may not be, um, they may not appear to be expensive or difficult, but they are on the time critical path. So, uh, and again, Microsoft Project encourages people to jump straight to the Gantt chart. So uh, that can happen quite often. Finally, you get to my top 10% of projects where there's actually a Gantt chart based on the critical path diagram, and therefore it's going to be correct. And I would say the post-its only take 20 minutes. You, you might as well involve the team. It's virgin on fun. It's easy then to make it into the Gantt chart, maybe another 10 minutes. So 30 minutes, you've done your plan. Maybe an hour if it's a really complicated project. So the first of my top 10 mistakes is to have a plan in your head and not to use post-its and not to use a Gantt chart. Okay, uh, moving on. My second one is when you're asked to do a project and it's going to be really, really tight, can you do it by Christmas or can you do it for under 20,000 or whatever? So it could be time or money. The mistake is to say, I might be able to do it. I'll see what I can do. I'll try. Because if you say maybe or I'll try, that sounds like yes to your customer or your boss. By the way, if somebody says to me, um, I might be able to do it, I'll try, what I hear is no. If somebody says, I might come to your party, I think, they're not coming. But for some reason at work, if you say, I might be able to do it by Christmas, or I'll see what I can do, people hear yes. And the only thing that doesn't sound like yes is no. No, you can't have it. So never say maybe because you've effectively said yes and it's tempting to do because you'll be the hero then good old hussein he's doing this project by christmas for me what a guy and he's only going to cost five grand what a guy and he's a hero but of course halfway through the year it's going to be oh hussein's running late and oh, hussein's overspending and by christmas it's going to be bloody hussein he's totally failed to deliver my project so you will turn to the villain later and you'll be remembered as failing so don't be tempted to say yes in order to have an easy life at the beginning. So if you're going to say no, 
you need to have a Gantt chart as proof because then you can say, well, unfortunately, I, I would love to do this project, but unfortunately, the Gantt chart says no. And also, if you're going to say yes, you need to make sure that you definitely can do it. So you want to have a Gantt chart just for your own peace of mind so that you know you can do it. So either way, if you have it planned out as your Gantt chart, then you know whether you're OK or not. And then you're not going to be in this wishy-washy world of saying maybe. You either know you can do it or you know you can't. So that's the second mistake, saying maybe. Now, the third mistake is, is linked to that last one a little bit. Because this is when they say, um, not can you do it by Christmas, but what's the best you can do? If it all goes really well, how quickly might you be able to do this for me? And like a fool, you tell them the truth. Like a fool, you say, well, if it goes really well and the IT works first time and nobody's off sick and the weather's fine and all the suppliers don't let us down, I might be able to do it by Christmas. But of course, what is your boss here? Your boss hears, la, 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 Christmas. And now you are doomed. And so are they, because they're going to go running off thinking, brilliant, I can base all my plans on getting this project done by Christmas. And they're not going to get it. There's a 99% probability of failure if you quote the best possible uh, outcome. So just don't mention that number. Once that number's out of the bottle, you'll never get it back in. Now, this applies for time and money. So if they say, what's the cheapest you might be able to do this for me? Don't quote that number. So what do you do when they ask you, when your boss says, how quickly do you reckon you might be able to do this? And you, the answer is you've got to weasel out. You've got to say, well, it's quite a difficult one. And, um, you know, we've got some new people on this job and a supplier let us down last time. So I think it could easily take a year. And quote them you know, something bigger than the average, halfway between the average and the worst case, probably. Don't quote them the, the smallest possible number. And if you're a boss, don't ask. If you're a boss, never say, what's the best you can do it for me? In? Because all you're going to get is a number that they'll never achieve. So you've gained nothing by doing that. Not unless you enjoy telling people they're useless at the end of projects. So that's number three, answering and indeed asking. The question what's the best you can do if it goes really well just don't don't even go there right mistake number four of my top ten is not involving your team enough this is quite different to all the other tips because the others are all technical things but here we've got a people one and I think quite often project managers because they're the expert on the subject or the most senior person they tend to think right I've got to do all this myself I've got to sit down and I've just got to come up with this plan and, and actually why not involve your team um, you know they'll enjoy being involved um, they'll have better ownership of the task and they'll probably do a better job than you would have as well because they've all got their own individual areas of excellence haven't they so involve the team on the listing of the tasks at the beginning in fact even before that perhaps in defining what the project is you might want to get the team in a meeting to say what's in scope and what's out but then the listing of the tasks, uh, estimating how much time and money do we think we will need for these tasks involve the team. Uh, the network diagram, the post-its I just showed you, the team loves moving the post-its around and doing all of that. Even if they've had no training, they immediately understand what we're doing. Um, the speeding up of the diagram, if it adds up to too much, and then you have to think, how are we going to crash this project? You know, shall we spend a bit of money on something or shall we reduce the quality? Shall we take some risks and overlap? Involve the team in that discussion. By the way, in between this one and risk, there's drawing the Gantt chart. And I think that's the only one that you have to do on your own as the project manager is produce the Gantt chart based on the network diagram. But it's very quick. Then thinking about risk, what might go wrong? How likely is it? How bad would it be if it did go wrong? Involve the team in that. Um, they'll be great for that. Um, and then the reporting of progress, you'd have probably a monthly meeting, but it might be weekly, where the team come to you and talk about what they've done and they're all held to account. And reporting on the finance as well. So somebody in the team would report on spend and then the whole team would discuss what that means. So I'm going to come to that later. Then rescheduling if we're running late, what are we going to do? We're halfway through the project, we're running a bit late. How can we speed up the second half? Uh, that's another um, discussion to have with the team. And finally, reviewing. What have we learned from the project? What was good and bad? Involve the team. And I'm going to come back to that one as well. So you could see all the way through, involve your team as much as you can. You'll get a better project, a happier team, 
less work for you and better results. Mistake number five that is commonly made is something I mentioned earlier on, but I want to have a particular rant about this one. Having a list of tasks, maybe with dates on, rather than a Gantt chart. And I absolutely hate this, even though, as we saw, it's really common. And the first thing I do when somebody says, here's my project plan, and they just show me a list of tasks, is I always say, oh, that's good. Um, where did you get the dates from? And they always say, well, I, uh, I kind of made them up, really. Because if you think about it, there's only two places you could get those dates from. Either you made them up or you boiled them down from a Gantt chart. And you could do that. You know, so here's my Gantt chart earlier. You could see that I could boil this down to the country starts here and finishes here. Find a site, start, finish. Buy the site, start, finish. All the floating tasks, start, finish, start, finish. I could make that back into a list of tasks with dates on. But why would I do that? Uh, because I've lost all the visibility of my Gantt chart. You can't see the overlaps. You can't see that, you know, here we've got these three things all happening at the same time. And you, you can't easily see the effect of slippage. If this runs late, I'm going to have to speed up either that or that. That one's much bigger. I'd probably speed up this one. But if I do that, then these are going to get a bit squeezed. This one might end up overlapping with that. Is that a problem? All those thoughts you can't have if you've just got a list of tasks. You can't even see the critical path if you've got a list of tasks, which is hopeless. And it's really common that, that people have a list of tasks and can't see the critical path, which is mad. So even if you had a list of tasks and it was right, it wouldn't be much good. But my point is it won't be right. It can't be, unless you've boiled it down from a Gantt chart. How could you possibly guess the dates that are on that Gantt chart? So a list of tasks is not a project plan. Hashtag Gantt or nothing. So that's number five, my pet hate, a list of tasks rather than a Gantt chart. Now, number six is a common problem, but I think it's probably the most difficult one to do something about, which is not planning for the resources of all your other projects, some other or all other projects. And it is really difficult to to work out what the effect is going to be of other projects. So you could have your project all lovely planned. In fact, there it is, nice Gantt chart. I, I know I've got enough resources to do all this. It's all looking good. But what I've forgotten is that in week 20, I'm going to be rammed sideways by some other project that's going to steal all my people. So the answer to this is a Gantt of Gantt, which would be something like this. So you can see on my Gantt of Gantt here, project A is complete, as indeed it should be. Project B is running a little bit late. I've done 60% of it. I should have done 90%. Project C is ahead. You'll never see that. I put it on for academic completeness. Project D, which you will see, hasn't been started yet. So project D is already late. So already you can see that this is brilliant for looking at progress. Have we done what we should have done? But what I'm after is planning for the resources of future projects. So I can see here that I want to do project E but I'm going to have a problem because F and G are both going to be happening at the same time as my project E. And that could be a problem. So I can look at this and I can think, do I have enough resources? And maybe F and G need different types of people. Maybe it's not going to be a problem, but I can look at that. Maybe this is the resource pro profiles for only my department. So it's obvious really, but the length of it is the duration of the project, that's the elapsed time, and the height is the resources I'm going to need. Could be money, but it's probably going to be people. So maybe D goes up one person, two people, three people, or maybe this is in hours per week or hours per month. So if you do one of these for your own department or for your bottleneck resource, let's say IT is your bottleneck resource, you can look at that and you can think, right, do we have enough IT resource to do E, F, and G at the same time? And if not, then we will already know that one of these three has to be shoved out into the future so that we can do the others. Or we can get more people. I mean, that's the two choices we've got. So if you've got a Gantt of Gantt, it allows you to plan for the resources of other projects. And I really would recommend that you produce a Gantt of Gantt in some way. By the way, your Gantt of Gantt probably won't be shapes. It'll probably be a spreadsheet. These will be rows of numbers. So this will be one, one, two, one, or one, two, three, two, two, one, or something like that. And then you can add up and you can see whether you've got enough people to be able to do all the projects you want to do. So that's a Gantt of Gantt. 
Uh, and I think it's absolutely it is essential, really, because otherwise number six is going to be a real problem. So the Gantt of Gantz allows you to see the past. Have you done what you should have done? And the future. Can we do what we want to do? It's really quick to see. It's great. You know, if I was the boss, I would absolutely want to see the Gantt of Gantz once a month because I can immediately see how they're getting on. I can immediately say, what's happening with B? Why haven't you started D? And are you sure you can do E, F and G at the same time? And if not, I can make some choices about which one of those I slip. So as the boss, I really want to get to Gantz. Now, would the project manager or the team want to have a Gantz of Gantz? And the answer is yes, because it's an arguing tool. They can use this to say to the boss, we can't do all three of those. Do you want to give us more people or do you want to shove something out into the future? So if they've got any sense, the team will want the boss to see the Gantz of Gantz. They've got nothing to hide. They're busy. We're all busy. We've got nothing to hide. So wouldn't it be great to be able to show a Gantt of Gantz to your boss and say, look, this is the problem. This is why I need more people. So it's mistake number six is not having a Gantt of Gantz and being taken by surprise by resource problems. Mistake number seven of my top 10 is letting people tell you stories rather than showing you a colored in Gantt chart. I have seen places where they produce a Gantt chart at the beginning, and this is their... Um, permission to do the project or they have to show it to a customer in order to sell it to the customer and then once they've got permission to do the job they just chuck away the gantt chart and then they just sort of make it up as they go along and i'm just thinking that is so mad you know why would you not having made it color in the gantt chart to look at progress but either because they've thrown it away or they never had one people quite often just tell you stories so you say to them how's the uh, you know, how's the new factory getting on and they go oh it's going really well yes we found a site and uh, we've, uh, we've already started uh, putting in the computers and you think, well, that's great. You're telling me what's been done, but not what should have been done. You know, should you be further on than that? Should the computers all be in? You know, should the desks be in? I don't know. So if someone's telling you stories, it doesn't tell you whether they're ahead or behind schedule. It just tells, them, tells you what's been done. It's also really time consuming. I, it's much quicker to see a coloured in Gantt chart than it is to listen to somebody rambling on about all the stuff they've done and the problems they had while they were doing it. I don't want to know about that. I just want to know what have you done compared to what you should have done. I mean, how behind schedule are you? So coloured in Gantt chart or nothing. That will avoid number seven. I think it's a really common problem, though, the telling of stories. Problem number eight is thinking that an underspend is okay. And this is a real beginner's error, but actually I've seen it happen quite a few times. Uh, this happens if you separate out finance from project management. This can be a problem. Now, um, if you've got a project management office, it shouldn't happen because they'll probably be doing both. Um, but if you've got a separate finance function, they will look at the money and they'll start to make all sorts of assumptions. So for example, suppose you've done half the project, but you've been spending twice as much as you thought so far. So you've been um, you know, refurbishing your buses, and um, instead of doing 50 so far, you've only done 25, but they've cost you 2,000 quid instead of 1,000 quid. You'll have spent 50 grand, and everybody will think you've done 50 buses, but you haven't. So if you've done half the work, but your spend is doubled, it's going to look okay. Now, more likely, if hopefully things aren't going to be that bad, you'll have done 90% of what you should have done, and your spend rate will be 110%. You'll just be spending 10% over. So again, that will look approximately like the project being spot on, but it isn't. It's late and it's overspent. So you've got to be really careful about this one. Generally speaking, underspend means that you're late and, and therefore you haven't, you know, because you haven't done all the work. You haven't spent the money because you haven't done the work. And that's because you've had some sort of a problem. Somebody was off sick or a supplier let you down or something had to be done twice. A problem was too difficult to solve easily. And therefore, because of that problem, you're going to end up being overspent. So underspending means lateness, which means there was a problem, which means overspending in the end. So underspending is not usually good. I mean, are things ever cheaper than you expected? Not often. By the way, overspending just means you've overspent. <laughs> so uh, you can't win. Um, but the main thing is the Gantt chart shows everything you need. So here are three examples. There are actually six combinations, but have a look at these three. 
Uh, the first one, we're meant to have spent 500. We've actually spent 550. So the accountants are going, mm, it's a bit of a problem. Are we bothered? Well, yes, because we're behind on the Gantt chart as well. So you can see that we've probably done only 450s worth instead of 500, and we've spent 550. So we're actually over by 100, not just 50. But half of the overspend is hidden by the fact we're a bit behind. The second one, the accountants think it's spot on, but the Gantt chart tells us we're actually behind on the critical path. We haven't done all the work, but we've spent the money so far, 500 to date. So therefore, we've actually overspent, haven't we? By the time we've done what we should have done, we're going to have spent more than 500. So this one is actually late and overspent. So that, that's a problem, and the accountants think it looks okay. The third one, the accountants think we're slightly underspent and everything's fine, uh, but actually you can see that we're way behind on the schedule. This first task was maybe meant to cost 200, it's cost 450. So we're massively overspent, but because we're so late, it doesn't look so bad. So you can see from all of those, the accountants are wrong on all of them. That's red, that one is a red, that's a red, and that's a red actually. And, and they were giving them amber, green, and green. So the accountants should not be putting red, amber, green on the numbers. Not until they've talked to the project manager and they've both had a look at the Gantt chart. So thinking and underspend is okay is a beginner's error. You know, look at that one there. Always compare the money with the progress and then you'll be okay. Number nine of ten is rescheduling too late. I think we've probably all done this. Now, why would we leave rescheduling until the last minute? And it's because, of course, we're hoping for some luck. We, we tend to say to ourselves, oh, I was so unlucky in the first half of that project. I'm owed some luck. You know, hopefully, somehow we'll find a way to catch up in the second half. So we don't have to tell anyone yet that we've got a problem. It'll be fine. And so we hold off and we hold off. And eventually, we have to confess. So basically, what you're really doing is doing nothing and hoping. And that is a terrible thing to do as your project runs late, hoping for luck. What you must do is confess as soon as possible. Bosses and customers hate surprises. So the key thing is to confess as soon as possible that you've got a problem and show them what your plan is. And your plan might be to throw money at the second half and catch back up. Uh, it might be to reduce quality in the second half and catch back up. It might be to take some risks and overlap some things in the second half and catch back up. Or it might be just to let the project take a bit longer, but do it properly and not overspend. You might even want to say to the customer, these are the options, what do you think? I'd recommend that, actually. Quite often, a choice of evils goes down a bit better than just saying we're going to have to take longer. If you say, do you want to spend a bit more or do you want it to take longer? That's often better. And remember, it might be the customer's fault that you're running late. It often is. It's often partly their fault because they've changed some things. So you can have that conversation with them. But whatever you do, don't surprise them suddenly at the last minute and go, oh, by the way, I'm really sorry. You know, we're six months behind schedule. Or we're a million quid over budget. So that's a common pro problem in projects, rescheduling too late. Finally, we come to number 10, not reviewing. Why would you not review your project when you finished it? And I think one of the reasons we don't review projects is we haven't got time. You know, we, we collapse in a heap at the end of the project. Thank goodness that's finished. And then we think, right, got to go charging on to the next cock up. And we don't really have time to sit and just think, hang on, you know, what have we learned? So uh, that's one reason why we, uh, why we avoid reviews. I think another one is we don't want to relive the pain. It was such a nightmare. Thank God it's finished. Let's just forget that. We don't want to relive the pain. And we don't want to confess all the mistakes to uh, our boss or our customers or you know some written report that who knows where that's going to go. It's going to be stored forever with our names on it. So not wanting to, uh, to confess our mistakes, I think, is another reason we don't review. Another one is not wanting to give away all our secrets, all the good stuff that we did. Or maybe if, we're, if it went well, we think we don't need to review that because it went fine. But of course, you still should write down everything good that you did uh, so that you can repeat it next time or that other people can repeat it next time. And even if it went pretty well, have a review to think how could we do it even better using the hindsight that we now have. There's one other reason for reviews, which is uh, not doing reviews, which is... Um, we're never going to do another project like that again. But of course, you will at some point in the future, you will do another project and then you'll be racking your brains for what happened last time we did this. 
So you should always do a review. Uh, all these objections, they're all false. There's no good reason for not doing a review because it doesn't take very long. And it's obviously a brilliant thing to do. I think the review should be quick and it should be fun. And my recommended location for a review is a curry restaurant. If you're in a country where they don't have curry, then I suppose pizzas would be okay. But uh, I think sit around a table, have some fantastic food, have a bit of a laugh, tease each other about the things that happen. Somebody can make some notes. That's your review. I think it's got to feel positive. It's like a celebration that you finished the project. And then people won't avoid doing reviews. And then once you've got the review, store it in a folder, build up a collection of reviews, and that will be a fantastically useful body of work. And it feeds back into the listing of tasks and the risks. So when you plan the project next time that's similar, you can look at the reviews and you can look at all the things they forgot and you can make sure you add those to your list of tasks. And then when you're thinking what might go wrong, you go back to the reviews for a second time and you think, well, what risks are there? Well, let's see what happened last time they did this. Oh, yeah, they had a barbecue and everyone got poisoned and then the tent caught fire. OK, let's make sure that doesn't happen. So it feeds back twice into your future projects. So that is my 10th uh, project management mistake, not reviewing your project. So that's the top 10 mistakes. There they all are. Um, I've zoomed through that. I hope it's made sense. I think it probably will have done. Um, if you can avoid all 10 of those, you will avoid 90% of what goes on in projects. And that is the end of my presentation. Thanks so much, Chris. That was amazing. Excellent. You're still there, Hussein. I wondered if you were there. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> I'm used to talking to loads of people, so it's kind of weird, but I was just channeling. He's there. He's there. Uh, plus other listeners out there. Who knows how many people are out there listening? Yeah. Oh, no. I'm sure everyone's been with us all this while. Um, one thing that I want to do uh, to, to sort of mention here, Chris, is that, you know, this obviously project management is such a massive topic for project management offices. Um, you know, it's one of the core pillars to make sure that everything is going as we need to go. And, um, you know, PMOs are, are essentially business units, but with PMOs, with, with project management as their key tool to make sure that the, the organizations are achieving the business results that they want. Um, and, you know, for all practitioners as well as aspiring uh, PMO leaders um, or for some PMO leaders, you know, this is definitely good to have because, you know, this is not one of your typical checklists that you'll see around, um, you know, finding on, uh, stuff online, stuff that you have a, to have a really good pulse on and really get a, a sense of what your project managers are doing um, to sort of uh, uh, make sure that they've got their, their head above the water on this one. Now, you know, one quick thing that I wanted to ask you, was yeah you know we've got top 10 but i'm sure you know you've you've had a ton in, in in here you know and you said okay you know i need to boil this down to 10 so just you know just let's go ahead and make room for the 11th you know which which mistake that you think is out there <laughs> that that you, you think should should be part of top 10 but didn't make it but deserves an honorable mention yeah because it was hard to get it down to 10 um i think my 11th one actually fits really well with your pmo theme which is overdoing your systems. Because I've been to quite a lot of companies that have really complicated, they have a PID you have to fill out that's 20 pages, and there's all these performance. And I think you do need some. You know, you absolutely should have a very simple permission to go ahead with a project, for example. And you absolutely should have a risk chart, and reviews should be compulsory. But I think some companies have a really complicated system, which most people don't even use. And then what happens is that people say, well, this job we're doing, it's not really a project, is it? So let's not get involved in all the project. And then they end up not having a plan at all. Um, and that's just the worst case, because just to have a simple Gantt chart would have probably saved them. So I think what happens is that enthusiastic people keep adding one more thing to the project management system. And eventually it becomes so big, it becomes unusable. And I think that's a really common problem that I've seen. And it's linked to software as well, because sometimes there's a software system that wants to know everything. And of course, it can't know everything. And, and people start to rely on the software. So, you know, you're never going to get a software package that says, you have missed three tasks in this project, or you will never complete that in five weeks. It will take eight. Because, you know, the software can't do that. 
But I think when people buy a really complicated bit of software, they start thinking that it's going to do everything. And um, so I think relying on a complicated system or, a, or an all singing, dancing bit of software would probably be number 11. Do you agree with that one? I absolutely do. Yeah, because we want to keep it simple. The PMO's job is to just help everybody to do stuff, but to keep it simple, isn't it? A, a good PMO. Yes, you know, absolutely. I mean, the idea is to get it done in a consistent, consistent, predictable way, yeah. uh, and whatever flows of work to get you there is is the way to do it. Absolutely, that's a great one, Chris. Thank you, Chris. I also wanted to, to find out, you know, um, are there any tips, tricks, or even tools? You talked about software. Any tips, tricks, tools that would help, uh, you know, project managers or PMO leaders to sort of, you know, avoid any of these mistakes? Well. Um, I mentioned earlier on post-its, which I just think, I know that's really low tech. I do love them though, and teams love them, getting involved with them. But for me, the number one thing is a Gantt chart. Um, and I do love, um, I do love Excel actually. I, I think Excel is actually better than Microsoft Project. I mean, if you love project management, uh, Microsoft Project, that's fine. But I think to, to have to, um, buy Microsoft Project and then learn it and then remember how to use it and then to fight with it to an extent uh, on the occasions when you do a project. I actually think Excel is really simple. Everyone's got it. And when you start adding up resources up in columns, because you could put numbers along here for how many people or hours and you could add them up and, and you could add out your rows and, and Excel starts to become really good. So for me, an Excel Gantt chart would be my number one tool. And I was thinking about this because the Gantt chart is really underlying almost all of my top 10 things. I mean, don't have the plan in your head, have a Gantt chart. Don't say maybe, but use a Gantt chart to either prove yes or no. And the best you can do, that's going to come from your chart, isn't it? It's part of involving the team, but not really that one. But certainly it's better than a list of tasks. It helps you plan for your resources. Um, rather than stories, I'd want to see a colored in Gantt. It helps you work out what the money means. It forces you to reschedule when you're halfway through because you can already see that you're behind schedule. It probably doesn't help with number 10, but I think it does pretty well at helping with all of, you know, nearly all of those top 10 mistakes. So I think our old friend, the Gantt chart from 100 years ago, is still pretty hard to beat. You know, I've looked at Agile and all this stuff, and I still think if I could have one thing, I'd have a little Gantt chart of what's going to happen next for my project. So that would be... The, the, the tip or the tool that I would go for. And it's easy, especially with Post-its first. It's, it's very easy. Awesome, awesome. I'm sure, I'm sure you've raised a, a ton of eyebrows with that one, Chris. Yeah, right. I wish I had shares in Gantt charts. I wish there was some way to, you know, to, to be Mr. Gantt of the world or whatever, but of course they just, <laughs> it's even better. Yeah, all well, you need is Excel, yeah. No, but, but you know, I, I've used Excel myself and, you know, Microsoft Project and, you know, some other tools like Maven Link, uh, you know, I like all of them, but in your from simplicity and, and, and getting getting started perspective, Excel is amazing. You know, I keep on telling telling um, a lot of people in general that, you know, uh, if, if, if I was to pick any Microsoft product that I loved, it would be the Xbox. The next one is Excel. <laughs> <laughs> I just absolutely love it. That's a great one. Thanks, Chris. I think actually whatever tool you want to, whatever software you want to use, as long as you use it to make a Gantt chart, I'm happy really. <laughs> right, right. So I guess really the, your, your favorite tool, the best tool that you would recommend is, is a Gantt chart, which obviously yes. is the underlying theme for the entire presentation. Yeah. But, but whatever, any, whatever way you want to get there, makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, they are fantastic. And you know, uh, one thing that I've noticed, you know, you, know have, you have a ton of PMO leaders, you know, you have some PMO leaders who are in Army of One who are trying to build a PMO as well as you know, do some project management at the same time, but you also have some project management office leaders who, you know, have, who, who, who have a team um, or have you know, indirect reports um, who are doing project management. So they may not have their hands uh, you know, deep and dirty into project management directly um, because they're managing other things that are required with the PMO. Um, but to make sure that you know, their project managers aren't caught up in these mistakes, what are some of the things that you would suggest they do to, to sort of keep their project managements, uh, project managers away from these challenges. What can the PMO do? Um, 
I, somebody told me once that there are two ways the PMO can behave. And one of them is to be a sort of helpful friend. And then the other one is can be a sort of a stern sort of traffic warden type enforcer who comes in and goes, that's not right. And, and I think you've probably got to do a bit of a mixture. So I think the first thing they could do is training. Just make sure all the project managers have had some training. Um, whether they deliver it or get somebody in, I think the PMO's job is to make sure that every project manager knows about all this stuff we've been talking about. You know, every project manager knows how to make a Gantt chart in Excel, you know, even. Because it's incredible how people get put in charge of projects and they just don't know anything. And, you know, for the last 20 years, I've been earning a living telling people about this stuff. And I'm amazed. You turn up and there's all these big senior managers from big companies and none of them know any of it. And they're going, oh, my God, critical path. I love it. And I'm thinking, I can't believe you've been doing this job all these years. You didn't know that. I don't say that, but I'm kind of grateful because it keeps me in work, you know. So I think making sure everybody's trained would be the first thing the PMO could really do. Um, and obviously coaching that goes along with that. I think the second thing that occurs to me is more the enforcer side of things. And they could say, I want to see your plan before you start your project. I want to see it drawn out, probably as a Gantt chart. I just want to check you've got a decent plan. And then if somebody just brings you a list of tasks with dates on, you could say, well, where did those dates come from? Have you got any contingency in here? And you could ask a few questions. So I don't think people should be allowed to start a project until the PMO have signed off the plan or at least signed off the Gantt chart. But I think a plan is more than a Gantt chart. It, it should include probably risk as well and stuff. So, but, uh, and perhaps a bit about why we're doing it, you know, what other options have been thought about. But I think they shouldn't be able to start the, the plan until it's signed off. And then probably some regular monitoring, you know, maybe a third of the way through and two thirds of the way through, the PMO should say, can we just have a, a catch up meeting and just see how are you are getting on with your project? Are you on time or are you late? Are you overspent? What's your plan for catching up? And then they can go into coaching mode again because the project manager may say, oh God, the whole thing's going terribly wrong and I don't know what to do. And then you can say, well, it's okay. We can help you with this. You know, these are your options, slipping it, crashing it, whatever. So I think seeing the plan before and during, and if I could just sneak in one more thought that's just occurred to me, which is the man and a big source of frustration I have is that I train project managers and then they go back to work and their boss goes, oh, don't bother with all that Gantt chart crap. We haven't got time for that. No, just run around on fire looking busy and it'll be fine or whatever. And, and it will be fun. We're trained because then they would say, where's your Gantt chart? Have you got some contingency? What are you going to do about that? Why don't you overlap those? And they could actually talk sensibly about the project plan because most people's bosses don't know anything about project management either. So I think, to get the project managers trained and to sort of fly the flag for project management higher up in the organization. I think that would really help It'll make life much. <laughs> so that's what I think the senior managers. So training a bit of enforcement before and during and get the managers of the project managers a bit more involved and a bit more competent if you can. I hope that's a good answer. That's amazing. Thank you so much for that, Chris. I think the viewers are going to have a lot of takeaways from that. And you've given a lot of tips and strategies here. Speaking of tips, you send tips regularly to 20,000 people. From those who are listening to us here, who are joining us, can, can you share where they would go to sign up for your tips? Uh, yeah, it was um, freemanagementtips.co.uk. So that's free-management-tips.co.uk. Uh, and if you just go there and put your email address in, then I will send you a monthly tip free forever and it will never repeat. Uh, so that's pretty good. I hope you like that. You always have some sort of effort into them because they go to 20,000 people. So I do write them carefully and uh, people seem to like them. They very rarely unsubscribe. So yeah, do head over to there and put your email address in. And, uh, and once a month when you're having a bit of a dark day, an email tip will come in from me, some clever little thing, hopefully. It might just be what you need at that moment to keep you going. So I hope you enjoy my, my free tip of the month. Fantastic. Well, this was amazing, Chris. Thank you so much for being a part of the PMO Virtual Summit. I'm sure everyone's enjoyed our session quite a bit. And for everyone who's been watching and listening to us, please sign up at free-management-tips.co.uk for Chris's Tips of the Month. Thank you so much once again, Chris.